all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or by going to veteransradio.net where we're on the web 24-7. You can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.net. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at legalhelpforveterans.com. We want to welcome to Veterans Radio today, Isaiah Ike McKinnon. I could call him Dr. McKinnon. I could call him Chief McKinnon. Uh, Ike, welcome to Veterans Radio. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And most of my friends call me Ike. Now, if we go back to when I was a kid, they called me Sonny. Oh, <laughs> so, okay. Oh, yeah. My, my good friends, they called me that. I grew up and they said that because I smiled all the time. Well, you, I had a sunny smile. <laughs> well, you, you have always been known as having a good disposition. Let me set this up for our veteran radio listeners while we're talking to uh, Chief McKinnon here. Um, he's an Air Force veteran, served from 1961 to 1965, and we're going to talk about that service. But afterwards, he went on to be a police officer in the Detroit Police Department and then had the opportunity to actually become its chief uh, of the police department. He was also deputy mayor of Detroit for a period. He, along the way, picked up his Ph.D. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about his education. He's been a professor uh, uh, around uh, Metro Detroit and and is a a well-respected and well-honored member of the community. And and all of that started back in uh, 1943 in Montgomery, Alabama. Tell us a little bit about your uh, mother and father. Well, and thank you so much. Uh, my parents were terrific people. And I tell you, my dad uh, was just a wonderful man who was born in 1900 in Montgomery. I'm sorry, Union Springs, Alabama. And he moved to Montgomery, I think when he was about 19 or so. And uh, he and my mother married in 1938. I was born in 43. Uh, but there were, there were actually eight kids. Three died at birth. And back in those days, um, uh, every all the kids were born at home, at night in hospitals. And my, my mother would talk about that all the time. Uh, and, uh, of course, in 1953, when I was uh, nine years old, the family moved to Detroit. My dad came to Detroit, like so many people from the South, to um uh, get a better job, and he did it at the, uh, the automobile factories, and it was just a great learning experience for me, learning from them. My dad, who was just a tremendously religious person, boy, I tell you, uh, he did not eat a meal or or sleep or rest without praying. Uh, he was the most religious person I've ever met, just a tremendous person. Yeah. Well, that says a lot, because uh, Dr. McKinnon sits on the board of uh a couple of religious organizations, and we now know where that all is grounded from. It's from his father, who was, uh, it's noted somewhere that I saw, he was a carpenter and obviously a tradesman moving to Detroit. But he also played uh, some professional ball with the Negro uh, League. Uh, Is is that right? That's absolutely true. You know, know, dads, and I'm sure I'm doing the same thing with my sons, they tell stories. 
And my dad told the story. <laughs> and some of them are true. <laughs> <laughs> some are true. And, and that's right. So he would he would talk about playing with Satchel Page, Leroy Satchel Page, and 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 some of the uh, other great Negro League players. And so he would tell us these stories, and we sit there just totally uh, mesmerized by what my father was saying. And I'll never forget he told us one story. And this is this is probably the most incredible story I've ever heard. He said, well, you know, there's this pitcher. His name was Booker T. Brunyan. And he said, son, he said, Booker T. Brunyan was such a good pitcher. He said he'd line up three barrels between uh, the pitcher's mound and home plate, and he could curve that ball in between all three <laughs> uh, <laughs> barrels. And, of course, when I'm young, I'm going, oh, wow, you know. And so I said, okay, so when I got – a little older when I was probably about 12 or something like that. I said, Dad, you know, listen, wait a minute. I said, there's no way you can do this. He said, well, okay, maybe it was two barrels. You know? <laughs> 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 and so then he, he, he brought it down to one. But you know, he would talk about Satchel Page, and he said, uh, son, Satchel Page is the greatest ball player ever. And so I was a young police officer just before the riot slash rebellion in 1967, uh, the Harlem Globetrotters were in Detroit for a game at the old Olympia Stadium. And I was in uniform. I was assigned to the stadium. And, and, and the guest at intermission was none other than Leroy Satchel Page. And so I went up to uh, uh, Satchel Page and I said, excuse me, Mr. Page. And I, there I was in my uh, shiny uniform. He said, what can I do for you, son? I said, Mr. Page, I told him who I was. And I said, uh, did you play ball in uh, Alabama with a man by the name of McKinnon? And he, he kind of wiped his forehead and he looked at me. He said, McKinnon, McKinnon, Minnick McKinnon. And he kind of wiped his brow. He said, son, I don't think so. I, I, I can't remember the name. So I was, I will tell you, I was disappointed. Uh, and, I, and I said, well, thank you, Mr. Page. <laughs> and I said, I turned to walk away. He said, son, just a minute. He said, McKinnon, McKinnon. He said, well, this, is, this guy, but Cody McKinnon? I said, yes. That was Holy my cow, team. yeah. He said, he, said, he said, guy about 5'9", five, 5'10", five, with huge arms. Arms that look like Popeye's arms. I said, yes, that was my dad. He said, oh, let me tell you something, son. And so for the next five or ten minutes, Satchel Page talked about my dad. He said he was the greatest catcher he ever saw. He said he could throw anybody out at second base. And these are guys like uh, those uh, those guys that you heard about back there who were so fast. The one guy who they said was so fast that he could uh, turn the lights off and get in bed before the room got dark, you know. <laughs> and it's, Satchel Page is telling me all these things about my dad. And he said this. Uh, he said, if the color line had been broken, he said, my dad would have been in the major leagues. And I was almost in tears. And he said... Son, tell your dad that I said hi. So, Jim, that I, is wonderful. I just, so I, I went, I went home that night, and I said, Dad, I said, guess who I saw tonight? He said, Who? I said, Satchel Page. He said, And <laughs> I said, I said, Well, he told me about you. And my dad said, And <laughs> he said, He told me you were a great ball player. He said, well, my dad said, well, I told you that all the time. He said, but <laughs> it had to be, he had to be verified by someone else. That's right. I said, I'm sorry, but listen, this is great news to hear. Now, that's a true story. It's absolutely true. Well, we're, we're glad to capture it here. That's really a, quite a piece of the Negro League uh, baseball uh, story. That's, that's, and your dad has such an unusual name. McKinnon's not all that unusual, but, but his first name is that it, that's what – really triggered it you knew he was telling the truth on this so yes oh yeah so, so let's <laughs> let's talk a little bit about and and i'm going to come back to this uh the race issue the the, the racial line uh because it, it's a recurring theme through your life uh from even as a young young boy at 14 you found yourself on the wrong side of police officers and getting beat up on the way home from school um, you've, you've mentioned the 1967, uh, 68, uh, rebellion or riots in Detroit where you were a police officer and the issues associated there. But before we get into that, because it's also kind of, 
you know, it, it's decades and decades later, but we still have this problem. Um, yes. But but we're in that period of 61 to 65, and, and you uh, decide uh, out of high school to uh, join up uh, and you go into the Air Force. Talk to a little bit about that decision, the Air Force, those sorts of things. Well, yeah, I grew up uh, in uh, an area of Bruce's, Brewster, which is uh, a project where Joe Lewis and Diana Ross and those people live. I grew up in that area and just north of there. And I will tell you, um, most of the young men that grew up in that area, they went to the Marines or the Army. And it was, it was a pride thing. You would see a young man come home dressed so sharply and everything. And, and everybody in the neighborhood, they were really moved by this. They were very proud that this young man or young boy left that neighborhood and went into the, the, the service, as they would call it. And so I remember in 1956, I saw this movie with James Stewart, Strategic Air Command. And I was mesmerized by the flights and everything, the B-52, I think, bombers. And I said, boy, I want to join the Air Force. I want to fly. And I made that decision uh, at that point that I was going to do that. And so I, uh, I, I joined the Air Force after graduation from the Air Force. In, I'm sorry, I graduated from high school in 1961 and went to uh, uh, the Air Force. It was just a, it was a, a tremendous and wonderful experience. I mean, a lot of people hated basic training. I loved it because it, it, it was a sense of discipline that most of the young people did not have, and probably even to this day. And I remember being in basic training and the things that we did, and I had these are tough uh, DIs that they were called, or GIs, but I learned discipline from them. I had discipline from my dad in particular, but not the kind of discipline that these uh, uh, DIs or the TIs uh, trained to us. I loved it. I loved the fact that um, uh, they were teaching me not only that, but love and respect for uh, the military love and respect for country uh, that I, I grew to be even more so uh, than I never had before, ever had before. Well, I, I actually think it's, uh, for folks who don't know uh, Ike McKinnon, have never seen him, uh, Ike, you were a pretty big guy when you came out of high school. I mean, you were 6'1", 210, strapping Big guy, I can just see you. I can just see you putting everybody to shame at basic training down in Texas. <laughs> you know, and, and you start to discover more things about yourself because there are guys who would say things and do things, and I would say, no, no, no. Listen, we're here for a reason, and we joined this. We were not drafted. We joined the military, and there are guys who uh, came from various locations around the country. It was really interesting, and this taught me something about there are guys from the South, there are guys from uh, certainly from Michigan, guys from Ohio, and guys from the East Coast, and everybody, we, we worked together as a team to, uh, to, to make our flight, what was called not a unit, flight better, and, and certainly I, I enjoyed it. I really did. I, 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 I loved the fact that it was so much discipline, which I thought was important for us and for every young man and, uh, that was there and, and in the country. Well, it, it also uh, ultimately applies to the rest of your life, and and uh, I'll come back to your military in a minute, but, but that discipline would have gotten you through your bachelor's degree at University of Detroit, your master's degree at Mercy College of Detroit, and your doctorate degree in higher education from Michigan State University. That's discipline, right? That's the discipline instilled in you. Well, y yes, it was, and thank you. But uh, let me say this. Um, what I try, tried to, to and still try to do at my age is to look for positive people. And if there are negative people, I, I distance myself from them. And, of course, there have been uh, negative people, not only in my life, but in things that happened with me. But I always look at this. There's a song because I always look on the bright side of life. And that's really the truth. I mean, I always look for positive things and positive people. And that has pushed me to the point that I am. I, let me say this. Um, when, uh, 
on the police department, there's there's some negative things, but there's more positive things. And I, I love that. And I try to take that and share those experiences with with everyone that I uh, came across. And it, it's helped me. Well, I think it, it certainly has helped you through your professional life and your personal life. But I'm going to slide back to a, a three years that you spent in Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota. <laughs> now, uh, when, when, when you saw a, uh, a strategic air commander or SAC base, uh, you thought, wow, this is glamorous. Minot, uh, North Dakota, not all that glamorous, <laughs> is it? No, but, but yes, you're right. But the, the, the uh, slogan is, why not Minot? But it, it's, it's, it's interesting that because that's what I fell in love with in, in 56 about being in the Air Force and, and uh, the possibility of flying. And so I, but I didn't know it would be as cold as it was in, in North That's Dakota. right, yeah. Yeah, but, but I got there and I was assigned, I was a, a, a machinist. And I worked on B-52s, I worked on KC-135s, I worked on the F, uh, F-100s, F-105s, and I love this. I absolutely love this because at that time, uh, here I am, this young man, 17, 18, 19 years of age, and I'm doing this, uh, sir, number one, in, in the military, but number two, for my country. And, I'm, and, and this is uh, during the miss, Cuban Missile Crisis, and uh, we were prepared to do whatever it took to... Um, uh, to protect our country. And I, I loved being an active part of this, Jim. I really did. Well, you were also given, and I think this is one of these things maybe kids thinking about uh, joining up maybe don't have an appreciation of. You were given a lot of responsibility. When you're the machinist or mechanic on a B-52, you're working <laughs> on hundreds of millions of dollars of equipment, right? You, you'd never see that kind of responsibility in the civilian Absolutely. world. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Think about and, and 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 working on the missiles, the, the GAM seventy seven missile. I would work on these things, and I, I when I we go out now and we see these guys working on these what they call cherry pickers. They're, they're working on trees, and I I operated that to get up uh, on the uh, vertical stabilizer or the horizontal stabilizer of a B fifty two or case KC one thirty five. I worked on those or a GAM seventy seven missile. Now you know the GAM seventy seven missile. I mean these are powerful things. And the B-52s were even more powerful. And I worked on these things as a young airman. And the, the longer I stayed in the military, the more uh, responsibility I had in terms of making sure that these uh, armaments were prepared to go and protect our country. And I, I, I thought it was one of the best things one could ever imagine. Well, one of the challenges, uh, and particularly at that time, you mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, certainly puts in context uh, one's role in the Air Force. But Vietnam's going on as well, and and uh, uh, in, in, mil- in 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 all their wisdom, they decided to, to send you over to Da Nang. Talk to us a little <laughs> about your year in Vietnam. Well, it's really interesting for me uh, because it was Vietnam, but it was not. A war, war Vietnam. It was a situation in which um, I, I thought I was going to spend my four years in uh, North Dakota, and I get my orders to go to uh, uh, Vietnam. And I remember one of the, uh, I, I had a part-time job working in the commissary, and one of the ladies who worked the register, she scared me to death. She said, "You know, if you go over there, they have these leeches, and they'll suck the blood out of you." <laughs> And I'm going, oh, my God. She goes, yeah, she said, I heard, well, she was wrong. You know, she was, these stories about the, the GIs over there, the leeches and everything. And so, but that was, anyway, so I, 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 I remember I had a flight from Detroit to Travis Air Force Base in California, from that to Hickam in uh, Honolulu, from, from there to Guam, from Guam to the Philippines, from the Philippines uh, to uh, Continental Air Base. And this, I think it was about 23 hours. <laughs> you know, I did not sleep the entire time. Anyway, so I got, I remember I got off the plane in Saigon and I stepped off and that heat hit me. And I went, oh my God, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make a year over here. You, you, you thought know? my not didn't sound so bad anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. 
<laughs> I, it, it was hot. I mean, it was steaming hot, you know? And so I said, well, maybe it'll take time, but I, I, there's no, anyway. So uh, I was in uh, Saigon for two days and then uh, I went up to uh, Da Nang. And Da Nang, at the time I got there, I think I had about six or 700 uh, guys. We had Army, uh, Marines, and Air Force. The Air Force, we had our F-105s, F-100s, uh, and we had the C-123s, the C-130s, because I worked on those. And at that time, it was not the kind of war that we, we grew to, to know about it. Anyway, so we had a, a, a what we call a containment area that had wire around it, and the Marines, thank God, and the Army, thank God, they were there to protect us and the airplanes. And so uh, uh, I grew to love and respect the military even more because of uh, the the service that they were doing and the protection that they had for us guys in the Air Force. And uh, I, we, we all became even better friends. Uh, the Nang was just an incredible place, in particular when you went downtown uh, to uh, the, the uh, just walk around and see uh, this this beautiful place. It was a beautiful place, uh, and I, I always told my 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 sons, in particular my youngest son, I said one day I want to go back there. And my youngest son, he said, Dad, I want to take you back there one day. I'm still waiting on that. <laughs> well, tell them <laughs> tell them to hurry up because you want to, you want to go. And and I think one of the things that you it, it sounds like you got out of your military service, and, and we sort of joke about this in the Navy, right? You saw the world, and you that's right. You oh, came yeah. back to Detroit with a whole, I suspect, a yeah, whole different yeah. view of not only your country but your world. That's absolutely true, and and the travels that I did. I mean, when I was in Vietnam, I went back to the Philippines. I went to Thailand, uh, again back to Guam and uh, Wake Island. I think we were also there, but it, it was it was. I learned to try and learn from people. And uh, one of the things in Vietnam that really stood out for me, one of the, uh, the people who worked at, uh, we had a little uh, restaurant that we had built over there, and we hired some of the locals. And this woman, one day, she didn't show up for work. And I said to her husband, who also worked on the base, I said, uh, where is Thoth? So was her name. He said, uh, our baby died. I went, oh, my God. It's the baby. He said, yeah. Uh, he said, uh, my son, Tan, T-H-A-N-H, was five years old. And I said, uh, is there a funeral? He, and he said this to me. Uh, he said, you come to funeral? I said, yes. Uh, so he said, funeral is tomorrow. And I got their address, and Jim, I... I uh, took the, uh, 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 we had the Air Force bus that took us downtown and I walked to their house and they had the baby's funeral uh, in the house. And they were just moved that here's this guy, this young man uh, from Michigan, from America, uh, coming to their son's funeral. And I had I'd never seen anything like this in my life before. Uh, one of the interesting, not one, but one of the most interesting things is there's this young baby who I think was five years old. He was lying in the bed. There wasn't a coffin, but he's lying and his eyes are open. And I said, uh, his eyes, why? And they said, uh, our belief is that uh, as you go into the great beyond, you go to God, you, you want you to see. And I said, wow, wow, you know? And, and it, was, it was just so moving to have that. And at the same time, uh, the priest who uh, uh, was on the base, he said, Ike, I want you to go down uh, to this village with me, and uh, I want you to help me. It was a Saturday morning. I said, what do you want me to do, Father? He said, um, uh, there's an orphanage there. He said, we have some work to do. So me, him, and another uh, GI went to the orphanage outside of Da Nang, you, know, you, don't, you don't think about dying at this time. You think about the life of what you're doing. So we get there, and this I think there are three nuns that, that had probably 75 to 100 babies, orphans there, and they needed help 
feeding and holding the babies. And one of the most rewarding things that ever happened to me was I was able to hold these, these crying babies and feed them and, and just uh, hold them and make them feel better. And we, all, we worked and, and built uh, little huts for them to stay in. That was probably the most rewarding thing that happened to me over in Vietnam. Well, it's one of those things where if you open your heart up, right, uh, all you, you, you can experience and learn all kinds of things. And, and it's yes. not necessarily book experience, it's life experience. And, and um, as you, as you um, came out of the military, how did those kinds of experiences uh, maybe reshape you as you thought about what do I do now? Um, that, that uh, you know, where do I go with my life now? It, it, it made me more empathetic uh, and more understanding of people. I knew I wanted to become a Detroit police officer, and that was as a result of when I was a young boy. But, uh, but you know, learning from other people and seeing how tragic and how bad some things were in other parts of the world, and here we are in the greatest country in the world, and here I am back in Detroit, and I wanted to become a police officer to help. And that's 1965, August 2nd, I joined the Detroit Police Department. It really is sort of, uh, and many people f- see this, you know, we serve for a few years and, and then life goes on and we go decades into our, our life and our maybe our professional career and our personal careers. And, and But you can sort of, when you look back, I, you can sort of feel the ripple effects from those four years, whether they were in Texas or North Dakota or Vietnam. You can sort of see those ripples still working through your life, can't you? Oh, there's, there's no question. And from being a part of this great uh, organization, the United States Air Force, the military, and meeting so many different people from different backgrounds, learning from them, and then going to other countries and listening to them, they, they really wanted to learn from America. They really wanted to, so many wanted to come here, but they wanted to learn. But they, they wanted us to be as... Uh, empathetic and kind as uh, as one could possibly be uh, to, to change their lives too. Well, we're coming to the, our end of, of the time here, to, and there's so much more we could talk about in terms of your career in law enforcement, but I guess I want to end with asking you, as you think back and you look at where we are today as a country, um, you, you have a sense of where the military is, um, is it still the kind of career, is it still kind of the pathway that you see advantageous for young men and women, sort of the kids coming out, you said coming out of Brewster, the, you know, the, the guys, the Army guys, the Marines would come back and everybody would have a lot of respect. How, how do you view that today? I, I, I really believe that the military is, should be, is the basic foundation for setting a person's life on the right path with the, the discipline for learning to care for people, learning to care for yourself. Uh, and I think it, it prepares you for the rest of your life. I mean, here I am 79 years old and still remembering and thinking about the things that occurred with my life as a, a young boy uh, wanting to go into the military, seeing uh, people who were in that, being a part of that organization, and even now uh, saying, this is what I believe, I really believe this. Every young man and woman uh, should go into the military and, and for a period of time for the discipline uh, to set uh, uh, their lives in a, in a great direction. No, I, th- I think a lot of us who've experienced that and are reflecting back think the same, and we just have to find a way to encourage more of our young people to see this as a very valuable uh, life lesson for them. Uh, Ike McKinnon, uh, Dr. McKinnon, Chief McKinnon, I really appreciate you <laughs> taking a little time with us today on Veterans Radio to share some of your stories and reflections on the time in the United States Air Force. Thank you for having me today, and God bless you, and God bless all of us uh, right now. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fawson. 
It's been a pleasure to be your host. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans, and you can reach us at 800-693-4800 or legalhelpforveterans.com on the web. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to its podcasts and Internet radio shows by going to veteransradio.net. And until next time, you are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We again want to thank our national sponsors, the National Veterans Business Development Council, nvbdc.org, VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettles Chapter, Ann Arbor, Michigan. VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423 in Ann Arbor. And the American Legion Press Corn Post 46, also in Ann Arbor. We appreciate all your support. You can go to veteransradio.net, click on the sponsor level, and continue to support keeping Veterans Radio on the air. And until next time. You are dismissed. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Forward, prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.